much for her presentation. So it's all yours, Diana. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to start by introducing my family. So come on, stand up here. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, Jim, Jim is my man. Here's my other man, little boy Darren. Uh, his son, Bradley, daughter Gail, sorry, and her daughter, Bailey, and my first great grandchild, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to sit down because I tend to walk around and throw my arms around. So, I'm going to start by telling you that my father, Perry Moore, was a Pawnee Indian from Pawnee, Oklahoma. His dad was a full-blooded Pawnee, and his mother was not full-blooded, but anyway. He was, he was very musically talented, and he was a bookkeeper. My mother was from, <coughs> excuse me, Southeast Texas, and she was musically talented. She was born with a natural ear and could play anything you said on the piano. So, it was amazing. They moved from Texas in the 1920s and they went to McNary. And it turned out that my father was living there and he was uh, working for the lumber company and riding horseback to deliver the payroll. And that was his day job. And then at night, he had a dance band. Well, one time the, the drummer didn't show up. And he said, does anybody know a drummer in, in this town? And they said, oh, Pete Fain can drum. Well, send him over. So here comes Pete Fain, 15-year-old. In Texas, everyone has a nickname. Pete was her nickname. She was Elsie <laughs> Moore, or Elsie Fain. <clears throat> Excuse me, Elsie Fain. So Pete uh, met Perry. And that the rest was history. Uh, they were married in June of June 21st, 1927. She was married. She was 15, and she turned 16 in August. <laughs> he was 20. He was five years older. So, and they they made music together. <laughs> and they made history together. <laughs> okay, so we have here mother and daddy courting in McNary. And uh, next, yeah, daddy, same picture, go ahead. <laughs> mother and daddy buy this wonderful car. I love old cars. Okay, and okay, so then. <laughs> They got married. <clears throat> they lived in Kansas for a while. Then they moved to back to Arizona, and they lived in Williams, where my two well, my, I had two older sisters, Bonnie on the left, and Shirley on the right. And this, these pictures were taken in Williams. Bonnie was 14 years older than I, and Shirley was 11 years older. Okay, so mother and daddy had a dance band. They played all over northern Arizona, and <clears throat> lo and behold, Mr. Duffy, who was the head of the smelter, came to Flagstaff to the dance. And they danced, and after the dance, he went up to my father and said, well, I want you to come to Clarkdale. I will give you a job. I will give you a house. You will play the dances for Clarkdale. <laughs> my, father, my father said, well, okay. <laughs> so they moved out in, in June of 42, and lo and behold, I was born at 1205 Main Street on August 21st, 1942. Do the math, I'm 76. <laughs> and so life in Clarkdale began. My sisters were 14 and 11 when I was born. And so I had the unique opportunity of being kind of a two-generation kid because my older sisters had. I knew all the names of all the boys and the girls of that era because of my sisters. But then I was the little 
the baby. And so then I had a whole other generation of my uh, kids that were my age. But anyway, so they got here and they started playing dances. And they played dances, um, well, all over creation. I think we have some photos of when I'm little, but uh, we'll. <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. There you want to go on? <laughs> there I am with my piano. I can play chopsticks, and that's probably about as good as I am today, too. Even though I took piano lessons, my mother just could not understand how, you know, I'm struggling, and she says, She'd come over to me and she'd say, can't you hear that chord? And she'd, you know, like that. And I'd go, no, I can't hear it. <laughs> anyway, my sister Shirley did become quite an accomplished, uh, accomplished pianist. But Bonnie and I were social butterflies and too busy to practice. So. But anyway, go right ahead. Uh, oh, now, we're all singers in our family. <laughs> and my mother calls this picture, Dinah Singing Light Opera. <laughs> and this, this is like a July 20th, 43, Dorothy and George Benatz. Dorothy Benatz was my aunt, and she, was, she came down to, uh, to Clarkdale in, I believe, like 39. She graduated from NAU, and she worked as the secretary to the high school superintendent. And she was, so she was here when my folks moved down. And then my grandparents moved down shortly after that. It seems like my grandparents moved wherever my parents were. I think because my mother was so young, my grandmother thought that the rest of us would starve to death. <laughs> so, you know, my mother was just a kid. But anyway, there they are. They were married and leaving on their home, uh, honeymoon, and that's me. And this got stuck in that with my two sisters. So go ahead. Next, next. Yeah. Okay, now this is Mama Chapman. This is my dad's mother. This is Mama Thane, my mother's mother, my mother, and me. With that look on me. <laughs> okay. Uh, continuing. Okay, this is one of my favorite activities. I dressed up and I haunted the, the block around Sunset Circle. This is the Sunset House, the house on Main Street where I was born was tiny and and they said as soon as we have a bigger house we'll move you and they did and we moved to sunset circle and it had two bathrooms and two sleeping porches with one bathroom in the middle and okay continuing on um here are his mother bonnie shirley and me in front of the sunset house okay <laughs> I'm proud. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, and here is St. Thomas Church in the very early days. And you notice it had a fence around it. it. The entrance was just up here, the door was there. And in 1951, I was nine years old. And I joined the children's choir. This is the cross I wore. And I'll pass it around because on the back of it, it has DM, Dynamore, and it has 1951, and it goes down the cross to 1960, where when I graduated from high school. And if you'd like to pass that around. OK. Um, this, OK, continuing on on the, on the church, Yes, there I am, wearing that cross, and this is me. Oh, there's the arrow. Okay. And, that, and that's also on the wall over here. So this was our children's choir, and I have to tell you, Lou Rothenberger was my fourth grade teacher, and she was also the organist for St. Thomas. And in those days, St. Thomas had a, an old pump organ. And Lou, what, I loved her, I just loved her, and she, she was not the best of, of organists, but she was dedicated and she was enthusiastic. And so you have to picture in your mind, here she is, bumping away and playing away. 
and then in some of the notes, you know, but boy, it was, it was a lot of work to play the organ at St. Thomas. And she was our, she was our, she played and helped the children's choir. So I love her dearly. Um, let's see. Do I have anything else to say about that? Okay, the cross is coming around. All right, next picture, let's see what we have. Okay, all right. So now we're gonna get back to some of my memories of things that I just remember about living in the Clarkdale house. Okay, I remember the house had a fireplace. It, does, it didn't have any central heat or anything. It, there was an oil stove that went uh, 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 in the night. I could hear that. It had a fireplace. Well, you know how much heat they don't. But I could stand with my pillow at the, at the hot fireplace and then run in and jump into my cold bed and hug that hot pillow. Um, in the kitchen was a monkey stove. I don't know whether you've ever heard of a monkey stove, but they burned coal, and we had a coal shed in the backyard, and the truck, the coal truck would come, dump the coal in, my dad would go out there, chop up the pieces of coal, make them smaller, he had some kindling, and this, this little part here opens up, and you can add kindling, and these come off, and you can dump the coal down in there, and it gets red hot, and actually, that probably heated our house more than anything, but it was in the kitchen, so you could put you know, your tea, tea kettle or pan of beans or whatever you're cooking on. So that's a monkey stove, and that's in our yard in Clarkdale. We, it doesn't have any back legs. You might notice it's propped on a rock, but, and it doesn't have the chimney, but that's what they look like. I remember um, we had an ice box. We did not have a refrigerator. We had an ice box, which is like if you go camping, you put ice in the, in the cooler. Well, that's basically what we had. We had an ice plant in Lower Clarkdale by the smelter. And they did have ice delivery, but I always remember that my dad drove down there and we picked up the ice and brought it home and put it in the bottom of the ice box. And then you dump the, as it melted, you dump the water out. We had a wringer washer. Uh, and a big tub there, and bring a washer, where, I don't know what, well, most, some of you know what ring or washer, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, we, a clothesline outside, where you hang your clothes. Um, we had a large, large stand of bamboo beside our house there on Sunset. And we had wild burrows in Clarkdale, and the wild burrows just went everywhere. And they liked our bamboo. And they would get in our yard if they could and be chomping on the bamboo. And my mother was like a rodeo star. She'd run out there, yahoo, and she'd get, chase those things out of the yard. I was scared to death of them, so I stayed in the house. But she'd chase the, the, the burrows out of our yard on a regular basis. But those bamboos provided me with castles. It was a castle, it was a house, it was anything I wanted because inside there were, we cleared away and we had little rooms. And we played in that, in the bamboos, that, that was our playhouse. My dad did build me a little playhouse with a wood floor and one wall. And I, I love that too, but we actually really played a lot in the bamboos. We also, um, I made lots of mud pies with that contaminated soil. <laughs> I, I didn't eat them, but I rolled them in oleander. Very I rolled them in oleander and made tacos. And, you know, all that. I mean, I played in the dirt all the time, and I'm 76. I may glow in the dark, but I still <laughs> um, So anyway, it, it, was, it was fun. That explains a lot about my sister. <laughs> okay, I see how it is now. No children. Okay. Next picture. I don't know what's next. It's down the road, dear. Oh, okay. So then I just need to keep talking. Yep. I remember 
Marjoram came in like a, a cube or something with a little packet of color stuff. And you pop that open and squeezed it out and stirred it up. And I love that. I, that was my job. I got to stir up the stuff and eat some of it. Oh my God. It was oleo, I guess. Yeah. But that, that's the way I was <coughs> at the war, and that's the way the butter came. Um, I remember listening to the radio. Clark, I, we didn't have a TV until I was in the fifth grade. But because we didn't get TV up here in no man's land. But we listened to the radio, and we listened to Fibber McGee and Molly, The Jack Benny Show, Inner Sanctum, The Shadow, The Hit Parade, Lorenzo Jones. I still remember. Da 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 da. Do you remember that music? Oh, I loved it. Daddy would sit in his chair, and be reading in magazines and newspapers, that's what they did. And I, he was very lenient. I would sit on the, on the, the side of the chair and pin curl his hair. And he had hair, only the fringe, he was going bald, and he only had, and I would pin curl all the way around him. And he'd just sit there and read. <laughs> like I said, I was the baby. Yeah. You know. Okay. Uh, I talked about the, the matati, that it was a, like a stone that had dirt and mud in it, and that's where I made my mud pies out in the front. There was a gully out in front of our house, and every time it rained, and it seemed like it rained a lot in those early days, I had red galoshes, and we would, my friends and I would go down and walk up the gully through the water as it was running down. It was, we played in the gully a lot. There was an exposed pipe, like a sewer pipe, and I, we would walk across it, and I always thought that was really a big deal. Later, now, as we walk by it, it's about that high off of the ground. I thought it was so hot. Maybe it's just filled in at the beach. Sure. Sure. I remember roller skates, where you clipped them on your shoe, and you used a key to tighten it up, and then you roller skated. And it, I didn't, I was never very good. I was never very good at it. But Sunset has one kind of where the front of our house is flat, and then it had a hill on both sides. It was a circle, but it went up the hill. So I didn't skate up the hill very much because then I'd have to come down. <laughs> anyway. So later, in, well, much later when I got older, then I got to go to Oak Creek Canyon and go up roller skating in the ice rink, or the roller rink in, at Indian Gardens in Oak Creek Canyon. Okay. I could have roller skated down on the tennis courts, but I don't think I ever did. Anyway. Um, riding my tricycle around town, around the block, that was a big deal. I started with a tricycle, then I graduated to a bicycle, and then everybody had bicycles, and we were like a there were lots of kids in Clarkdale, and we rode bicycles everywhere, all over. I knew everyone in town, in Upper Town, I rode, because that's where I rode. Um, it, it was amazing. We played Ditchum, you know, it was just like today. It was safe. We didn't, our parents didn't worry about us, you know. We just played out in the dark and had a great time. Um, <clears throat> I remember my grandmother, well, that's okay, they, they lived up the street on First South, which was not very far from us, and I would go, and I, I stayed there a lot as my grandparents, or my parents were playing the dance, they would babysit me, and so I remember being carried out to the car after a dance, late, you know, asleep, and put my own bed. Okay, I'm sure some of you remember Rathiolate and Mucuricum. Oh yeah. oh yeah, those glass bottles with the glass stopper and you know, they put it on stings like crazy. And you know, I I was in in the nurse's office a lot with getting that smeared on my legs. Okay. Well, my mother was of the opinion that almost any ailment known to mankind can be cured by using Vicks Vaporub or methylatum, number one, or 
the enema. <laughs> you remember the big red bag and the long tube? Oh, I was on the receiving end of these treatments more than I care to mention. My, my mother had a thing about enemas. She gave my Siamese cat an enema. <laughs> I was sticking it down my father's fishing boot. I love poor cat. <laughs> I remember pushing my baby buggy around the block, probably dressed up in my finery that you saw, and with that Siamese cat. He would let me do anything to him, and I would put a baby hat, whoops, a baby hat on him, a bonnet, and he'd lay, he'd stay in the buggy, and I would push him around the block. He was a killer cat. I mean, if he got in a fight, the other cat lost. But he would let me do anything to him. And here he is. That's my friend Bobby Hubble. He lived just down the street. And, and there's the bamboos behind, and the cat there. That was after the end of I guess. Okay, I remember playing paper dolls by the hour, and my my sisters drew the most beautiful clothes, you know, and we'd color them, and they'd cut them out, I'd cut them out, and then my mother was very lenient. She let me build paper doll houses all over the living room floor. We had three throw uh, rugs, almost about this size. And we put paper walls, just strips of paper, and then I'd fold cardboard or paper and make make um, furniture, and then just play with my friends by the hour. And that's that's a fond memory. I also played jacks, and a golf ball made a really good uh, bouncing high. Um, I remember. <coughs> I remember going to Selma's grocery store because my grandfather worked in the vegetable department and he had a big cart where he hauled the vegetables and he would push me around the, the, the store on the vegetable cart. Okay, I remember another time, this, this falls under the um, Henri little sister, I, I, not Henri, I was probably three, maybe four, and I, was, I had good manners, but my sister was getting ready for a date. And she wasn't ready, so her date was out there on the steps. And I, I went out to talk. Well, apparently I'd been having a little gas that day. <laughs> so, so later, somebody, my mother or Shirley, calls out the door to me and says, Dinah, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just talking and pooping. But every time I say, excuse me. <laughs> All right. I remember playing school by the hour, especially after I started school. And I was very bossy. My children, my, all my friends had to be my pupils, and I was always the teacher. My aunt said she knew I would grow up and be a teacher because I was so bossy. But anyway, I, I loved playing the school. I had a chalkboard. Uh, there was something about paper and pencils. I still love paper and pencils today. But I also, I played office. Now, my dad would sometimes have work to do at the office on Sundays after playing a dance on Saturday. He'd go to the office, and he'd take me with him. And the office was over here. You know where the arches are? Over here, Clarkdale, the top of the hill here. That was where my dad worked, and on the left side was his office, and then on the right side was the post office. So he let me climb up on the big, tall chairs while he's doing his work, and he'd let me have paper and pencils, and I scribbled, and I mean, I was doing my work too, but it was a, it was a wonderful memory. Then I loved going to Jerome to J.C. Penney's. J.C. Penney's was in the what is now called Spook Hall. And in those days, they had a they had a, another level up above that was just around the edge, and they had a a system where they had wires that came down to a central place, and you paid your money down there, and then they pressed the button and zoop, it went up, and they put the money up there or something. So. I decided I had to do that in my bedroom, so I rigged up a pulley with a rope, and I I would have a clothespin, and then I'd put my money, and then I'd make it go. 
you know, I have to copy whatever I saw. I remember, I remember that one day our car burned up. Our car caught fire in the middle of the night. Well, it was actually early morning, but it was dark. And I woke up and I, it was summer because my windows were wide open and here the car, the flames are. Well, it scared me to death, but I tore into my parents' bedroom. The car's on fire. And I remember that they ran around looking for their shoes and nobody, they were so upset they didn't turn on the lights. But anyway, <laughs> um, in those days, Parkdale had fire boxes in different parts of town. And when you had a fire, you pulled the fire box and that set a signal down here to the, to the fire station and they would see where the location was. Of course, the best way was to look for fire and smoke, but um, they, the, the whole town turned out for our car and it did burn right to the ground. It was a big fire. And somebody came, it was on sunset, so there was a little bit of a hill parked there in the bushes and it didn't set the brake. It rolled down with the going. So it was a very exciting <laughs> night or day for Clarkville. Um, I remember, oh there I am, standing in front of my grandparents' house in, at the gate. And that's on First South. And then later my grandparents moved down where the Bonazas lived, down below the railroad tracks. And they moved to a house beside it. And my grandfather had a big garden. He grew all kinds of wonderful vegetables. He had chickens, fresh eggs. So he kept us fed. <laughs> and um, anyway, it was great. Um, my parents were both hunters. My fa mother and father went deer hunting all the time. And there, somewhere in here, you'll see a picture of my dad. He killed a bear up in Williams. So um, I remember. Lots of music. We had jam sessions all the time in our house because they practice or they just, people, friends would come over and they'd play. And of course, it was so humiliating to me because I, I was a little shy. And Picture that. As soon as I walked in the room, my dad would break into Dinah, is there anyone fine? And, and so I hated it. I, my name has like, uh, someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. You all know all these Dinah songs. Well, I've lived with them my whole life. Anyway, then my, my Aunt Lucy, my dad's sister, was she was a mover and shaker in early Sedona. She was the second, second realtor in, Harris, in Sedona. Sedona was a little village. It was very tiny. And, but she, um, you know, in those days, the movie stars came to Sedona and made lots of movies. And my aunt was made friends, and she was in charge of getting extras. And anyway, she met a guy named Ali Rubel. And Ali Rubel is a composer. And the, the most, <coughs> this one says, I'm sorry, I want a Ferrari. And he says, for Dinah and P. T, no, P, D, and Perry, instead of P, D, P, E, T, I, E. Anyway, this is uh, James Cagney and Shirley Jones, Never Steal Anything Small. I've never seen this movie or play or whatever. But he's quite famous for this one, Zippity Doo Dah. He wrote that. And he came to the house, and he and my mom sat, and they, have, they played together, and he sang Zippity Doo Dah to me because that was his song. So that was great. Um, I remember laying, you know, no seat belts. So you get, you know, remember the back seat and the big window up behind and that thing up there? That's where I like to ride. So I'd lay up there in the back window and watch the sky go by. Oh, so much for safety. Yeah. I like to, I remember seeing my dad ice skate up at Watson Lake on top of Mingus Mountain when it was after a snow, and Bonnie and Shirley skiing. In fact, Bonnie was pregnant and came skiing down the hill, and she was like five months pregnant. Um, but anyway, I remember walking downtown and going to the drugstore where they had a fountain, five cents for ice cream cones. And I had an ice cream cone most days of my life. Um, later, when I got older, I had cherry coke, 
you know, right out of the fountain, wonderful cherry cokes. I remember going to the movies, 25 cents to get into the movie. I remember I went to the Wizard of Oz. I ran out of the Wizard of Oz screaming and crying on the front sidewalk out of the theater because it terrified me. You know, I've never seen any TV or anything. It terrified me. I still remember when my blood chilled as the lady's riding her bicycle and she turns into the witch. Well, I, I've never seen anything so terrifying. I don't think I even made it through the flying monkeys. Um, I remember spending a lot of time in the infirmary. That's where the Historical Society is now located, but that was the infirmary. And I had, uh, until I was five years old, I had a lot of fevers and uh, because I have deep infections that they never seemed to find. Anyway, when they finally did, I got to go to the Jerome Hospital and have my tonsils out. And the Jerome Hospital, if you go in there today, there's a beautiful bar at the end of the Grand. It's called the Grand now, the Grand Hotel. And if you look straight above you in the ceiling, that was where surgery was. And at the end of it, it had green windows, green glass. I remember laying in there, seeing the green glass, having the cloth of ether put on your face. You could smell that ether and counting backwards from 10. And then the next thing I remember was sitting out on the balcony watching, I getting to eat uh, I probably popsicle or something, and then, because you spend the night, and then watching them dump the slag in Clarkdale. So I could see that from the hospital in Jerome, and I remember watching the slag go down. Speaking of the slag, that was, that was one of our entertainment. We, my parents would get in the car, we would drive down here along the Tapco Road and park and watch the slag being dumped at night because they dumped the slag from the smelter all the time. And then if you continue on that road and you go along, and I don't know whether you've driven out lately, but there's a place where the town of Clarkdale now has a um, a launching site for the kayakers. Well, right past that launching site, on the right-hand side, there used to be the most magnificent spring, spring water. It flowed just nonstop all the time. And it had watercress growing there, and people would take their jugs out and fill it, and it was wonderful water. There's also a spring in Oak Creek Canyon. But then you go on a little more, and then you turn right, and you make that L turn, you keep on going, then you come to the swinging bridge. Oh, that was another thing. We all liked the swinging bridge. I was always a little afraid, but we did it. Um, oh, there's the bear. So, and I, I must tell you that later, my husband actually rode his motorcycle across the swinging bridge. <laughs> anyway, um, but then Daddy would drive on past the swinging bridge, around, and there was a water, low water crossing that went over to Tapco Power Plant. But that low water crossing was where we drove out and he washed our car. And I played in the water, it was very shallow. So that's where our, that was our car wash. So, um, I remember, I remember playing nurse because I spent so much time in the infirmary that I had my own nursing kit and my mother would allow me to have out of the bottle of alcohol and the cotton swabs and so, and I had a, I had a pretend needle so, you know, I covered my doll, dolly's bottom and gave them shots all the time. <laughs> um, I remember, um, I remember, okay, the train came into Laura Clarkdale because it brought all, everything that came into Clarkdale either had to be trucked in or come in on the train. And they had, at that time, they had big oil company, I think Texaco Standard Oil, there were a bunch of them. All that came in and uh, brought food in for the grocery stores and Miller's Warehouse. So I remember doing that. I remember, um, I remember, there was, it was hard to get to Clarkdale. Clarkdale was the end of the road. So the, in the early, early days, the only way to get here was over Mingus Mountain or down through Schnebley Hill. 
And then later they drew, they made the road through Oak Creek Canyon. But there was no such thing as I-17. So to get to Phoenix, we went over through Jerome, over Mingus Mountain, down through Yarnell Hill, down to Wickenburg, and into Grand Avenue in Phoenix, and then you got to Phoenix. And we went there a lot because my sister Shirley's husband was stricken with uh, polio uh, in 1951. 51, yeah, or 52. My memory is slipping. Anyway, and so we went to see him a lot. He was in the hospital for three years, and then he went to another hospital for a year, and then he came back and they moved him up here, where the four doctors, we had four fabulous doctors in the Verde Valley, three of whom lived in Clarkdale. Dr. Brill Hart, he had a son my age. Dr. Cranmer, who delivered all the babies and Dr. Bright, and, and um, those three lived there. Dr. Bates lived on Bates Drive, in, which is Bridgeport. But anyway, those men took care of my brother-in-law, and he lived 16 years paralyzed from the neck down in an iron lung, and he stayed awake, uh, I mean, he stayed alive because of the fine care he had. The whole community took care of my sister and brother-in-law. So, Anyway, then, okay, so I got off on the track here, so that was the way you got to Phoenix, but then, then they started building what was later to become I-17, and so then we could drive over the mountain and in Prescott Valley take a dirt road and go off through Humboldt, Dewey, Mayer, and you zigzagged around and you came out onto this gravel road about where Rock Springs is. And that's, it was gravel to the end. But that was the beginning of I-17. And then the la one of the last restaurants that you come out of Phoenix coming north was called The Curve. And I think that curve is still there. I don't know whether it's open, but we always stopped at The Curve. And then you went back through the dirt roads and mountains and came back home. So when I-17 was built, finally, it was a big deal because we could get to Phoenix faster. Okay, then I remember, I remember, um, okay, TV didn't come, uh, we didn't get a TV until I was in the fifth grade. Okay, but I could, I loved, I rushed home, I loved watching Mickey Mouse Club. And the dancers, do you remember Annette Funicello oh, and Bobby? And they, I mean, I was just taken away to another world because I was convinced that's what I would be doing. Um, it was wonderful. I love Dick, Clark, uh, Dick Clark's American Bandstand. We watched them. And we, in fact, we had record players, and the kids would come over to my house. We'd throw the rugs out, out of my bedroom, and dance and practice, and we really were dancers. Or we would go to David Brillhart's house and do the same thing. We danced after school. Um, I remember the uh, Marcus Lawrence Memorial Hospital in Cottonwood. That's where the four doctors practiced. And Maddie Lyle, who was a member of St. Thomas, was the woman who did everything there. She cleaned floors. She was the head nurse. Fabulous. And there was also another, uh, Fabiana Caballero was a fabulous nurse, could give a wonderful shot. They were all mainstays at that early hospital. The Verde Valley Country Club had one of the finest golf courses in, in Arizona. It was wonderful. It was out there around Pex Lake, and it was a beautiful grassy area where the whole Verde Valley came for picnics. It was a wonderful place. And later they had the 4th of July uh, celebration out there where they would shoot the fireworks off of number five tee box up there over the lake. And everybody, hundreds of people would be parked over there watching. It, it was just a beautiful place. Uh, my parents played golf, they, dan they played many, many, many dances out there, but they, when they played, I got to go sometimes, and the, the golf pro had a son, Stanley, and he and I would play, uh, go all over the golf course, because he lived out there. Um, I remember 
Okay, well, Peck Lake. Peck Lake, even at one time, allowed boats out there. And I can remember that my mother, she, this was after my father had died, but I get, my husband gets very emotional remembering all these stories. My, my mother was not a swimmer. She could never learn to swim. But Bob DeVault had a boat, and he said, I will teach you to water ski. And so they hooked her up, and they took off in the boat. Well, she fell, and immediately her two rubber falsies flew out of her. She screamed, save, save my, my, my what she call them, my floaties or something. I don't know. They, they labored, they didn't let anybody go. I mean, they, they stopped boating on there, and then uh, tragically a young man drowned in the Peck's Lake when I was in high school. It was overgrown with weeds, and it just took over the lake. Okay, uh, okay, now I remember the lower school where I went to school. And this is, I think, so wonderful. I, well, this part isn't so wonderful. I was, we walked to school, and so I walked down past the Catholic Church, down Miller Hill. Okay, there was an honorary little boy from the reservation who, who would wait, be in waiting there for me with a, a, a gobby spear. And then he would chase me to school. And I, you know, I just, oh, I did not like him. And I thought, I don't think he would probably have really stuck me. But he, I was always afraid of him, and he chased me regularly. Well, so in 1970, then I gave birth to daughter Gail at the hospital. And I'm in the hallway, quiet, nobody around in my robe, looking in the nursery window, and this man in green, order, it was an orderly, he came up to me and he stood beside me and we we're talking about the baby and visiting and then, and then he says, by the way, I, my name's Willard Beecher. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, he was the nicest guy. And, and that was a little ornery kid that used to chase him. <laughs> anyway, he grew up and he was a nice guy. All right. Now, I'll get to the next part of the lower school. This is great. I, in kindergarten, played in the little kitchen. It was a big room, two rooms together. And they had a little kitchen, little white cabinets and tables and dishes. And I played, in the, I played with the toys in there, and I played house. And then along comes Darren and Gail. They go in the same kindergarten. They played with the same <laughs> dishes, the same kitchen. It was glorious. I mean, groups. Yeah. And then I remember that outside the school was nothing but dirt. Dirt and rocks. Dirt and rocks. Not a blade of grass anywhere. We had big swings in the front. We had a teeter-totter. They don't even have those anymore. They have the, the, the merry-go-round things that you'd get killed if you roll under it, you know, but anyway, we had it. They had basketball court, and then around the ball field, they had um, uh, railroad ties all the way, it lined the basketball court. Well, you know, I mean, the baseball diamond. That is wonderful, eye, hand, uh, eye foot training, and we walked and ran around those that by the hour playing, but I loved, I, I was a first grade teacher, and I discovered this book called Rocks of Oxen, and it's a story written by a woman in Yuma, Arizona. And guess what she did? She and her friends made an imaginary uh, town up on a hill with rocks, which is exactly what I did with my friends at the lower school on that, on that what is that? That direction. North. On the north side, it was shady over there. We we put rock rooms down there and we played house there. And this is what this woman did. And they they each had their own house. This could be me. Um, and then they had, oh, they they elected the mayor and they had, you know, they had the boss and they chased each other around with sticks. And it, it's just, I thought, 
that's my life. I should have written this book. Yeah. Anyway, I love it because even though we had no grass, we had lots of fun. And um, I, I never would drink white milk because I did. I would make me throw up if I even thought about it. But I loved to get to go down and carry the tray of the little milk cartons if you got to ch be chosen that day to carry from the refrigerator to the class, even though I, I couldn't stand it, I wouldn't drink it. Okay, uh, I remember. Okay, I talked about that. Let's see, something else came into my mind, but it blew away. Okay, all right, well, let's see. Um, what's the next one after that? Next picture? Yes. Nancy and Dolls. Oh, okay. Well, show that one and I'll tell that story. Uh, this is my friend Nancy Bean. I had lots of girlfriends, but she and I loved to play. And she lived in the house where later my aunt lived. But um, she had, in her coal shed, a playhouse. And it had electricity. And she had one of those little plug-in stoves that actually gets hot. Yeah. And she and I would go. Her mother always had to take a nap every day. And I, I, anyway. So we played back there by ourselves, and we made cookies, and we did all kinds of things. And I went home, and she went in the house, and later the fire truck came. <laughs> because the chef caught the fire, because she wasn't going to play him. Anyway, all right. I remember when I was in fifth grade, I went to the lower school from kindergarten through fourth. Oh, and in third grade, my third grade teacher, Mrs. O'Brien, taught me baton lessons. I took baton lessons. So in fifth grade, all the students come up to the upper school, which is now the magnificent Copper Museum. I went from fifth grade to the senior in high school in that building. So I know that building. And in fifth grade, one day at lunchtime, everybody was out. The bell rang, so we're all coming back in. Some kids were in, some kids were not. And we're mixed, high school down to fifth grade. And I, my class was the fifth grade class on the end, across the hall from the boys' bathroom. And I had gotten back into my class, in the boys' bathroom, underneath that, in the basement, is the boiler room. Well, that day, the boiler blew up. And the whole building, kaboom, shook. And then, like that, it was filled with black smoke. Well, you know, schools practice fire drills. Well, I'll tell you what, the kids scattered like marbles, <laughs> and, I, and I will tell you that I ran at 90 miles an hour down the length of the hall, down, out, down the sidewalk, across the street, and of course everybody in town heard that explosion. My father was, had come out. I leaped into my father's arm. I was scared to death. Nobody was hurt, but there was a boy in the bathroom. And, um, and the door jammed, and he couldn't get out, so he's in there screaming. And uh, by then, of course, of the whole, all the townspeople were running into the school to see if anybody was hurt. Or, and the guy, well, the custodian, had seen the color of the smoke change, and he knew something was going to happen. And so he was starting down the steps into the basement when it blew, and he he was thrown several feet. He he didn't get hurt, and he. But luckily, I mean, nobody was hurt. But it was quite exciting. <coughs> so, okay. Now let's see. I remember. The, oh, I didn't. I don't remember this, but I was told that when my sisters that age, so ten years older, my mother would come like once a month, once a month anyway, on a Friday, and she'd go up in the auditorium of the school and just. Play, play. The kids would call, they'd gather around the piano and they'd shout out a name and she'd play and they'd sing. They had sing-alongs. She wasn't doing that when I was in school. Okay, I do remember that every Wednesday, as long as I can remember her, she went downtown to the King's Cafe, which was, is now called Main Street, Main Street Restaurant. The King's Cafe and went in the back room where the Kiwanis met and they sang and she played every Wednesday for Kiwanis for as long as I can remember. Um, okay, I remember. Okay, this is a this is something. 
the dreaded part of my life. Going to the dentist. <laughs> All right. Dr. Peckridge. Edith, Edith is a Peckridge. I must say, to, before I start, Dr. Ray was a lovely man. He was a very lovely man. But, you know, these were the dark ages. And his office was at the top of what, the main business block over there on the very end, upstairs was where his office was. And to get there, you had to walk up the wooden stairs. It was like walking to the gallows. <laughs> break, 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 and you smelled it. You smelled it before you ever got up there. So you go into the end, and you sit there. And then the windows, it, the wind was always blowing. Leaving through the window. I, I mean, it was like a horror story. So then, but, and you didn't get to just walk in, and it's your time. Okay. No, a dentist appointment with Dr. Ray, bless his sweetheart, could last anywhere from an hour to three hours because sometimes in the middle of things, he would just stop and he would leave through the back door and maybe go down to Town Hall and fill, fill out papers because he was on the council. Or maybe he went home for a snack. I don't know, but he, he but you waited. So I didn't know that you went, that you could go to the dentist and have an appointment at a certain time and go in. But anyway, he was a lovely man. But I was a, I was afraid. I didn't want a needle in my mouth, so I would not allow Novocaine. So I had all of my teeth filled. The white knuckle method. And I held on, and he, when he worked on me, he had a little thing of smelling salts in his pocket, so that when I was fainting, he, and he put it on. Mm -hmm. And then, do you remember spinning into the little bit miniature toilet? This little, thing, yeah. a little white thing. He spit and then went around that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And going up high, you know. And he, well, he was the sweetest man, but I could count every pore in his face, and I knew very clear because you're eyeball to eyeball, and we knew each other very well. Anyway, later he moved from that place. He built a new place, and I went there too, as it clear through till I graduated from high school. My ba he filled all my baby teeth. They fell out. He filled all my permanent teeth. And I see it because I wouldn't drink that milk. I always had to have chocolate milk. So anyway, he really did fine work, and I've been to a dentist. I still have my teeth, but the dentists I've been to say, you have very fine workmanship in your mouth. I said, I know I did. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I, my mother bought his new cars. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was a sweet but I did not like going up to that building. That was really horrible. Um, then I remember also up in that building, and a happier note, down the hall, was the Rainbow Girl, the Masonic Temple was up there, and I went to Rainbow Girls there. And I loved rainbows because it was like paper dolls. I got to wear a formal all the time. And so I had a lot of formals, and it was it was wonderful. We, and I, I, did that for years, and then they built a Masonic temple in Cottonwood, and then we started going over there. But um, I had fun in Rainbow Girls, and I became a state officer, and I went to Rainbows and Phoenix and whatnot. All right. Then in 1958, well, we became we were very small. The Jerome Jerome became a ghost town. Clarkdale, a lot of people moved away because they worked in the smelter, and they went to Marinci or. Douglas or somewhere down there to keep the jobs. Well, so we, Jerome and Clarkdale consolidated, and we were still the teeniest little school. Uh, and <laughs> we had, we had a, our bad uniforms were black and orange from, from Jerome and red and silver from Clarkdale. So we looked really sharp. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of the people to fill out the band, they just had to carry the instruments if we were marching, but they couldn't play it, so it didn't happen. <laughs> anyway, we had fun though. It was a very small school. And then in those early days, they had they decided to have something called Spook Night in Jerome. 
And so they let the kids from our school go up, and we would, there were lots of empty buildings in Jerome, and the storefronts. And so we'd each get a storefront, and then we decorated for Halloween and the first spook night. And it was great fun, and then we got prizes for whoever won the decoration. So that was, that was cool. Um, but then in 1958, we consolidated with Cottonwood, and those Cottonwood kids came over, and oh my gosh, all that new blood. It was amazing. It was a big school then. <laughs> yeah. Boy, when I graduated in 1960, 52 in my class. Woo, that was big. And then I went away to college, and I was, I thought, my gosh, that, that was really big. Okay, but going back now to the community concerts. Everything took place in the Mar Marcus Lawrence Clubhouse. The, the boys played basketball in there, and we had lots of community concerts and uh, theater, community theater, where everybody took place. And I believe Jim has pictures of the theater, right? Yes. Okay, this is my dad right here on the end. He was always on stage singing. You know, he was a musician, but he was also, he could sing. My mother was always at the piano. I mean, that's just it. And then people from all over the community did put on these shows. And um, so, next one. I like this one because it shows the ads. And I have to pick, I have it up here, but um, you see Clarkdale Cleaners, Connor and Edinger, that was the pool hall or the newsstand. Cottonwood Lumber Company, the Bank of Arizona, we had our bank up here. Jones Furniture was up on the end, and uh, the United Dry Goods Store. So all, they had the ads up for this, I don't know what show it was, but anyway, and there's Daddy on the end there. Okay. And then, of course, oh, my parents, I told you, they played all over creation. Well, they played Purple Sage was a bar in Cottonwood, and they played there regularly. And so that was an ad in the newspaper. Okay, next one was what? Oh yeah, no, there's Daddy uh, playing. He's got his saxophone on him and he's playing the clarinet. You see people having a good time dancing. And then, next one. <laughs> there he is sitting. You know, my father was a shy, tiring guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was an entertainer. All right, now, um, Let's see. There was a beautiful bowling alley, which I never went to, but it was downstairs under the Clark Memorial. Out back was the beautiful swimming pool, and I probably hold the record for the longest, uh, for the person who took beginning swimming the longest. <laughs> every year I went, every year I was in beginning swim, swimming. At the end of the year, the next year, I was still in beginning swimming. I never. I, I just had this thing about swimming, and it was ice water. They always gave the lessons at the beginning of summer, and that water was freezing. There was no filter, so by Thursday night, you could see in the bottom. <laughs> Jim was a lifeguard, and when we were first married, he did not like to clean the pool by or go in the pool by Thursday night. Uh, there was also a wonderful library. And I love going to the library. I remember the smell of it and the, the stacks. And I'd go in and sit on the floor and pull out books. I, I loved books. And I spent a lot of time in the library. Um, let's see. I remember, oh, my daddy taught me to, to drive. And, uh, and so Clarkdale was here. Cottonwood was over here. Okay, there was nothing in between, nothing. And there, there was an old dirt road that went, it was called the Old Jerome Highway, I believe. Was that right, Jim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it had dips in it. And so that's where my daddy took me out there and I very patiently stick shift and taught me to drive down that road through the dips and it was glorious. There was nothing out there. There was no mountain gate. There was no uh, pine shadows. There was no uh, Del Webb. Nothing. There was the water tower, was uh, the water place where, where they, it's still there, but there was nothing else. You drove, you, you didn't, you drove the old road 
Dow Miller's Hill, the old highway to Cottonwood, you came in the, down at the other end. That's the way you went to Cottonwood. You didn't go to Cottonwood this way. So anyway, it was a different look to the area. <laughs> um, my aunt, my aunt Dorothy Benatz, after she had left the high school, she went and she worked for the town, and she was a mayor forever. Anyway, she used to ring the noon whistle, and so she had the button behind her desk, and you know, look at her pop, boop, ring the whistle. Well, some people set their watch by the official noon whistle. Sometimes she missed it by a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Okay. Then, then I remember when they uh, they built Phoenix Cement. That was a new boost for Clarkdale, and all of the cement that they dug out there, they drove up to Page, where they built the Glen Canyon Dam with the Clarkdale cement. Um, I think am I forgetting? Oh yeah, I have to tell you that Evan Derrick. We haven't got. Oh yeah, there I am. That's the 1946 Clarkdale Annual. And I was the kid on the piano. I was three, and I was in that play. So I, I'm in the 1946 end. Um, Evan Derrick played, he was a master carpenter, and he was also a master guitarist, and he played with my folks in the band some of the time. But he took, my mother got the bedstead off of the bed I was born in, and he made it a beautiful cradle out of it, and she shipped it to Milpitas, California, where we were working, living, and Darren was born in Milpitas, and he stayed, he slept in that cradle. Then we brought it back to Arizona, and Gail slept in that cradle, and now it's at Gail's house, and Bailey slept in that cradle, and then now Ronan, when she, he goes to Grandma's house, he sleeps in that cradle. <laughs> There's <a road. laughs> I, I must tell you that Joe Wolverton uh, had the, I don't know if he owned it, but he worked at a, the Bridgeport Tavern. That was another great place to dance and eat. And Joe Wolverton was a class, uh, a fabulous guitarist. He taught um, Les Paul, Les Paul, Mary Cork, he taught Les Paul, to, Les Paul to play the guitar, and he played with my folks. Also, our house where Jim and I live now, he lived in Clark in uh, high school in his junior and senior year. They, his parents bought that house, and they sold it to somebody else, and then we bought it back. But um, the man that lived in our house way back when was named Jack Lynch. And he was a pilot. He taught Lindbergh how to fly. And uh, he also was here. He was brought here by the Clark, Senator Clark. Um, well, um, what was his name? William Clark III, Tertius. He wanted to learn to fly, so he brought Jack Lynch. And Jack Lynch lived in our house. And then three months after he got here, they crashed the plane. And so on Jack, on Jack Lynch's death certificate, it has 1419 First North Street, which is where I live today. So I have a touch to history there. Um, let's see, where am I? Oh, Ronan, Ronan, Ronan. Um, let's see. In my, in 19, I think about probably 59, my dad started teaching my mother the bookkeeping. And it took, because she had never worked outside the home. She was always at home, or she was playing dances, but she never had a job. So she went, she learned bookkeeping, and then in 1960, when the, when the next class, the class of 61 went, went to Jerome, my mother was hired as a bookkeeper, and she went to work up there. And that was a good thing, because in 1960, I went away to ASU as a freshman, and I was terribly homesick. And in those days, it was prison. You couldn't get out. They wouldn't let you get out because they were afraid you wouldn't come back. <laughs> and so uh, I was in ASU, and my, my daddy, bless his heart, he would write me a little, just a postcard every day, go walk across the breezeway, drop it in, so that I had mail every day while I was so homesick. 
and he walked across on September 22nd and dropped that card in the mailbox and he never made it out of the post office. He had a massive heart attack and died right there. And so that was, he was 52 years old. And it was very traumatic for me, of course. <laughs> but um, it, 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 that's what happened. But luckily, he had taught my mother the bookkeeping, and she was able to have a job and go on with her life. So that's a good thing. Um, I don't know. Did it, well, I guess I, I thought we had more dance pictures, but that's OK. I showed them there. Oh, you showed them. OK. I really, I'm going to stop at this point because this t covers most of my young life. I'm not going into the high school and college and beyond, but needless to say, it was a wonderful life. <laughs> it's still a wonderful life and we feel so blessed because our own children chose to stay here. Yay! And so we, I retired early from teaching just so I could babysit my four grands. And I had my own kindergarten, you know, it was the best of both worlds. The kids didn't have to worry, and uh, my own children didn't have to worry about who the babysitter was, at least I don't think they did. <laughs> and then now, now it's coming around, Gail's getting ready to retire. Gail is town manager of Clarkdale and she's getting ready to retire. <laughs> Darren, Darren is, um, well, I wrote it down, I never remember his title. <laughs> What's his title? Where is it? He is the um, Chief Operations Officer at Molden Graphics, which is right up here on the corner. And he lives, I can see his house out of my kitchen window. So we can keep an eye on each other. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's been... It's been wonderful to grow up in this small town and feel such a community. It's a community, and it still has that feeling today. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Are you prepared to take questions? Sure. And uh, I want a question. Does anybody know what that car was that my parents were standing by? What year or anything? He can go back and show you. Uh, I I just I love that car. I don't, I never saw that car. That's not the one that burned down. Does anybody know what it is? Twenty-seven Hudson be my best guess. Okay. Well, it's a great one. Yes. 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 This hangs in my, uh, Gail's office. This is a printed on some, uh, some linen. material, linen. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't give the date, darn it. But Christmas Dance American Legion Clark Memorial Clubhouse, uh, 9 to 12, and admission is $1.20. Wow. $1.20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And these are my dad, my daddy's clarinets. And uh, they are really, they're, approaching 100 years old. And I've never had them restored or anything, but um, they're, they're wonderful. And his saxophone, my nephew has, and, and he had it restored and he plays it all the time. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, and I have a stack of old music. I mean, I've got a lot of music stuff. Yeah, well, I have a big stack, yeah. And then this is our family when when Bailey and Matt were married, and, and that was so it was, you, how long almost ago? Two, almost two years. Almost two years. Uh -huh. So you can take a look. Anyway, have some treats. I've got a lot of good food. <laughs> Before you go, get up to have your retreat. Or I have retreat. Questions? Um, <laughs> you know that the Historical Society is a tax free uh, society and I'm broke all the time. Uh, and uh, so, this is an opportunity if you enjoy these kinds of programs, if you have spare change or a dollar, we're going to pass this hat that reminds me a lot of Daddy's hat that you saw in there. We'll pass it around, and if you want to put something in it, if you don't want to, that's fine too. Start it here. That little the one with the purple stage. Yeah. 
the picture that had the purple sage? Do you want to see it? Yeah. I want to see the phone number down there. About five. Well, it's a four digit phone number. Yeah. Yeah, that was five hours. See the phone number in the bottom corner? Oh, yeah. We did it in one day. And then the dirt road cut off some of that time. But it was, it was a big trip. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is a picture. I didn't show this. But these are my sister's yes. uh, people. And the names are all on the back, which I think is wonderful. And this is Bonnie, and this is Shirley. And I, I, I don't know what the occasion is. This is Amy Roberts. She lived in the um, lodge over there. And Amy is with them. So I don't know whether these are the girls from the, from the junior class or the senior class. I don't, well, it wouldn't be the senior. Maybe it's not one class, because Bobby and Shirley were not in the subclass. I don't know what the occasion Maybe is. Maybe Rainbow Girls? They were I don't forms? No, they weren't Rainbow Girls. <laughs> So I don't know, but anyway, they're, it's a pre, they're all formal, so maybe it was a pre-prom. All, all the names are on the back of that photo. That's, that's really the, the yeah, beauty that's the, yeah. is that, that they are. Um, oh, and somebody still have my cross? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't lose it. Let's give uh, Dinah a oh. little Are you going to take questions? Well, yeah. Any questions from question. any of you? Things you want to ask about? Sure. Yes. Did Shirley have polio as well? Yes. I thought so. Yeah, she had polio. My sister Shirley had polio as an infant. And because my grandmother, she could, she took her for like three days and rubbed hot oil and moved her legs constantly as a baby just constantly, and I think that helped her. She was crippled and her leg was twisted, one leg was shorter. So uh, that's why she played the piano, because she couldn't get around as well. Bonnie and I were, yeah, I hate our little boy. How are you? This is the, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Yes, we, um, we're sort of honoring William Andrews Clark.